Now let's pick up where we left off in Chapter 11. At this point, hopefully, you are understanding all of the terminology and the classification that we've gone over so far with the neurons in this chapter. Now I want to take a look at more of the physiology of nervous tissue. Some of this is going to be very similar to the physiology we saw with our muscle cells. But we're going to go into it in a little more detail now that we've got a basis of our understanding. Now recall, we've already talked about the function of a very important protein called the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump is responsible for moving three sodium molecules out of a cell every time it brings two potassium molecules in. So you need to keep that guy in mind because he's going to be very important. Now one thing we did not really do in a lot of detail in Chapter 9 that we need to focus on now is talk about the different stimuli that can be used to change the structure of an ion channel found in a membrane, causing it to what we would call open or close. There are one major type of ion channel that we consider always open. These are called leakage channels. There are sodium leak channels and potassium leak channels on your membrane of every cell in your body. They are more important now that we're talking about neurons, nervous system cells. We've talked about the other major type of ion channel before, a gated channel, but we've never talked about the different things that could open or close the channels. There are chemically gated or ligand gated channels. There are voltage gated channels and mechanically gated channels. Chemical or ligand gated channels open when something binds to the channel. This is what we saw back in our discussions of acetylcholine binding to a cha sodium channel and opening that channel on the muscle cell. Recall that that sodium channel did not open unless acetylcholine was bound to it. We're going to see this again now that we're in nervous tissue. Voltage-gated channels are the type of channels that open or close in response to changes in membrane potential. We've seen these before, but it did not use real specific terminology when we were going over them. The voltage-gated channels open and close depending on the charge state of the membrane. Recall that normally the inside of a cell is more negatively charged. Whenever something happens that can cause these charges to switch, that can make the inside of the cell become more positively charged, and that can serve as a stimulus for this channel to open. We saw these types of channels as we were looking at the propagation or the movement of the depolarization down the muscle cell. Recall that only acetylcholine was spit into the area of the synaptic cleft, but the entire muscle cell, we said we understood it had to depolarize. So there had to be something else opening these channels. So we've seen these before. Now let's talk about resting membrane potential, a term again that should be familiar to you. Resting membrane potential is established by the function of the sodium-potassium pump. It is also established by the sodium and potassium leak channels. It turns out that the membrane is much more permeable to potassium than sodium, meaning more potassium can leak than sodium can leak. I now want to just direct your attention to your My Study area, your My AMP area of your Mastering AMP site. If you go here and choose Chapter 11, you're going to see three AMP Flix videos. The first video, Resting Membrane Potential, is a very good video at showing you what causes the inside of the nervous tissue cells, the neurons, to remain more negative when compared to the outside. So now in the video, it's showing you the light representing the movement of signal down neurons. This is the plasma membrane of a neuron. This is the inside. This is the outside of the cell. The inside of the cell is more negatively charged when compared to the outside of the cell, which is more positively charged. When the cell is at rest, you have three major things occurring. You have these red things, which are sodium 
leak channels. And you have these blue things which are potassium leak channels. And then the third thing you have going on is your ATPase, constantly moving three sodiums out and two potassiums in. Because of the way the sodium potassium pump is working, you have more red on the outside, more sodium, you have more potassium on the inside. The sodium leak channels allow a little bit of sodium to leak to the inside of the cell. The potassium leak channels allow potassium to leak out of the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. Since you have many more potassium leak channels than you do sodium leak channels, you are going to get more positively charged ions flowing out of the cell than positively charged ions moving into the cell. This allows the outside of the cell to remain more positive and the inside to remain more negative. This little guy right here is showing you that we can physically take a voltmeter and put an electrode on the inside of your cell and it will read negative 70 millivolts. This is the resting membrane potential. This purple guy here is showing you the sodium potassium pump. Three sodiums out, two potassiums in. Three sodiums out, two potassiums in. The action of all three of these guys together, the sodium potassium pump, the sodium leak channel, and the potassium leak channel allows us to maintain resting membrane potential. We keep the inside of the cell more negative and the outside of the cell more positive. It's very important to understand. Whenever we get a change in membrane potential, because we are going to move moving different concentrations of ions back and forth across the membrane, we end up getting what we call graded potentials. If you get enough stimulus in one area, that graded potential can become an action potential in which you get enough difference in charge distribution to send that charge state across the entire neuron and that is how we're going to be able to send information from one neuron to the next. We're going to use some familiar terminology. We're going to talk about depolarization and repolarization. Remember, a depolarization was when the inside of the membrane became less negative or more positive. The depolarization is going to be linked to a movement of sodium ions into the cell. What we've seen before is a repolarization. And remember, repolarization was when you made the membrane more negative again on the inside, approaching back to resting membrane potential. This was linked to potassium moving out of the cell. Something that's going to be new now that we're talking more about nervous tissue is not just a repolarization, but we're going to see the cells hyperpolarize, meaning we're going to want the cells to not only go back to resting membrane potential, but they inside of the membrane even becomes more negative than resting membrane potential. This is still going to be linked to the potassium movement out of the cell, but we're going to see this hyperpolarization following the repolarization. So let's take a look at how this is going to work. If this was the axon, the long process of a neuron, and we took something and we stimulated this, this axon, we could cause a mechanically induced opening of a sodium channel. Sodium could rush in, and we could depolarize just this one spot. If we just opened one sodium channel, that would not be enough to truly change the charge state of the membrane to cause an action potential. What we would see is what we call a graded potential. 
a localized change in the membrane. But if we continued to stimulate this membrane in the same spot, we would eventually get the inside of the cell positive enough that we would open a voltage-gated channel next to the originally open sodium channel, allowing more sodium in. And then we would see what we call a propagation or a spread of the graded potential all the way down the axon. And that's how we're going to get the action potential. This graph should look very familiar to you. There's a reason that I tortured you with all of these things in Chapter 9, so that it would be easy once we got to Chapter 11. All action potentials have four phases. Now remember, when we're looking at this graph, we're looking at what's happening in one particular place on the membrane. Remember that as this part of the membrane depolarizes, that causes the next spot to depolarize, and then the next, and the next, and the next, and so on and so forth. Once the depolarization gets about here, then all the spots behind it are going to start to repolarize. So when we're looking at this graph, we're looking at just one spot. One particular spot on the membrane is going to start out at step one, resting membrane potential, negative 70. We'll then see a decrease in the negative charge. The membrane will become more positive on the inside during phase two. That's depolarization. Once the membrane gets to about positive 30 millivolts, we then see a switch goes back more negative on the inside. We enter phase three, which is the repolarization of the membrane. Now here's what's a little different. Notice how instead of going back to resting membrane potential, we have this phase here called hyperpolarization. Because these four steps must occur in every particular part of the neuron for an action potential to be complete, there are certain times when it's impossible to have another action potential or possible but harder to have another action potential. Well, I guess I got a little bit, changed my notes order a little bit, but that's okay. So we're going to see these two phases as we go through the absolute refractory period, and the relative refractory period. So that's where we're headed with this. Okay. Let's think about what channels are going to be open when. Now I have it all written in your notes for you, but I want to look at the picture to go over it. Okay. So again, from here to here, resting membrane potential. What channels are open? Sodium potassium pump is working potassium leak channels, and sodium leak channels. Those three guys are always working. That's just the only thing happening during resting membrane potential. As we move up and we begin to have depolarization, this is when our sodium channels are going to be open. That's why we would say at this point, we're increasing the permeability of sodium. Think about what caused those sodium channels to open. They were stimulated, right? Most likely by another neuron activating this neuron. Once this particular region of the membrane depolarized enough to depolarize or activate the next part of the membrane, we then move into repolarization. During repolarization, the sodium channels close and the potassium channels open. That's why we see an increase in potassium permeability, but a decrease in sodium permeability. We then continue into hyperpolarization, where the cell inside of the cell is now more negative, and that's because our potassium channels stay open for a little while. Eventually, Potassium channels and sodium channels are all closed, and we get back to resting membrane potential. So let's think about what has to happen for an action potential to occur. For an action potential to occur, we have to do something to the membrane that makes the inside go from negative to positive. 
in order for a repolarization to occur, we have to have something that makes the membrane go from more positive on the inside to more negative on the inside. Okay. So can you look at this graph and figure out where is it going to be impossible for me to start a new action potential? To have an action potential, we need to depolarize. So we have to go from negative to positive. So the only place you can absolutely not have an action potential is when you're up here, right? When you're already positive. If the inside of your cell is already positive, you can't make it positive. So this is going to be the area that we call our absolute refractory period. Now let's think about where would it be on this graph when it is possible to have another action potential, but it might be a little harder. So to have the depolarization, we have to go from negative to positive. We have to get all the way up here to positive 30. Where would it be harder to do that? Starting about right here, right? Because right here, you are more negative. So you have further to go to get up here to this positive 30. So this part of the graph is where you're going to have your relative refractory period, okay? which is what's defined here. And now shows you on this graph a little more clearly where I haven't been running my highlighter all over the place. Okay? So stimulus begins depolarization. Depolarization switches to repolarization. The area here in green is your absolute refractory period. Then we go down, finish repolarization, then we hyperpolarize. This is your relative refractory period. It's a little harder to depolarize the membrane because it's more negative than normal. Possible, but a little bit harder. Let's think about why we want this to happen. Do we want our neurons sending an information, sending a firing signal when, when we're not ready? We don't, right? We don't want our nerves sending signals to our muscles all the time, telling our muscles to contract when we don't want them to. We would look pretty crazy if we were just sitting around with our muscles contracting all the time. So we need these little built-in relay systems. We don't want our muscles to contract too often. So we have this time when it's impossible, then a time when it's a little bit harder. There are some parts of our nervous system that are capable of sending these action potentials, sending the information faster than other parts. There are two major things that influence the conduction velocity, how fast the action potential can travel down the neuron. One thing that affects this is the axon diameter. Larger diameter fibers have less resistance so they can actually have a faster impulse. That means the bigger the axon, the faster it can go. Another thing that can affect conduction velocity is the presence of myelination. Remember from our first audio lecture that myelin is the wrapping of Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes around axons. If you have them wrapped, it allows for saltatory conduction, meaning a faster movement of the action potential. And here is why. If we have no myelination, no insulation, and we stimulate here, that stimulus is going to decrease as we go. May not make it all the way down the axon. So what we would have to do is stimulate here, then as it starts to degrade, Open more sodium channels, stimulate again. As it starts to degrade, open more sodium channels, stimulate again. But the way your body's designed, we don't have to work quite as hard. We get our initial stimulus here, open these sodium channels. The wrapping by the Schwann cells allows the signal to stay strong longer. It insulates it. Then we get to our first node of Ron VA, where we have no wrapping but another collection of sodium channels. So we can then 
stimulate, depolarize again, and travel. This myelination allows the signal to travel much faster. You can almost think of it as a signal jumping from one node to the next. Well, this is great, right? So far we've talked about how we can get the signal to move along the axon. But how did we get that initial signal? What was it that activated the first signal? What opened the first sodium channel? Well, most likely a signal from a previous neuron. The gap or the junction between one neuron and another neuron or one neuron and its muscle cell is called the synapse. If we're talking about signals going from one neuron to the next, we call the first neuron the presynaptic neuron, and then the second neuron we call the postsynaptic neuron. This is going to be very similar to what we saw with muscles, just a little bit different. Most of your interactions between neurons and neurons is going to be axo dendritic or axosomatic, meaning the axon of your presynaptic neuron is going to deliver the signal to the dendrite of the next neuron. Axosomatic is when the axon of your presynaptic neuron delivers the signal to the postsynaptic neuron at the point of the cell body. The other types are possible, but really rare, and so we're not worried about them right now. We'll flip to a picture to say all of these things so we can talk about them. Okay? So here's my presynaptic neuron. Here's my postsynaptic neuron. This should look very similar to you, to what we saw when the neuron met the muscle cell. Okay? So here comes the action potential down the neuron. When the action potential gets to the end or the terminus of the presynaptic neuron, voltage-gated calcium channels are opened and calcium floods into the presynaptic neuron. The calcium into, in the presynaptic neuron causes the presynaptic neuron to release synaptic vesicles containing neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter will then bind to a channel on the postsynaptic neuron, causing some sort of change in membrane potential on the postsynaptic neuron. This is very similar to what we saw in muscles because we saw acetylcholine released, right? Acetylcholine bound to the sodium channels on the muscle, causing depolarization. Very, very similar. Now we're just looking at a presynaptic neuron interacting with the postsynaptic neuron. We want this to be a very short-lived interaction, so as soon as the neurotransmitters are released into the synapse, we're going to have enzymes that begin to degrade these neurotransmitters and pull them back into the presynaptic neuron. Now there's only one thing that makes this a little bit different than what we saw with muscles. The presynaptic neuron can actually have more than one possible effect on a postsynaptic neuron. And that depends on the type of postsynaptic neuron and the type of neurotransmitter. The postsynaptic potential can either be an excitatory postsynaptic potential or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. With an excitatory postsynaptic potential, what is released out of the presynaptic neuron into this synapse right here is going to bind a sodium channel. So let's see if you understand. If I bind a sodium channel and open a sodium channel, sodium will rush into the cell. When sodium rushes into the cell, that causes a depolarization. The depolarization is the first step of a action potential. So if we release something that opens a sodium channel, that will cause an action potential here to travel through this neuron, go and affect another neuron. We've excited this neuron because we depolarized it. Let's think about the other possibility. If 
the neurotransmitter released from the presynaptic neuron released a neurotransmitter that instead of bonding a sodium channel, bonds a potassium channel opening that. Potassium is going to leak out of the cell. When potassium comes out of the cell, that does not depolarize the cell. That repolarizes, and in this case, hyperpolarizes the cell, making it an inhibitory response. So whether or not the presynaptic neuron activates the postsynaptic neuron depends on what type of channels are open. If we open a sodium channel, sodium is going to rush into the cell, making it more positive on the inside, and we get a depolarization. That is going to be the excitatory postsynaptic potential. The other possibility is if we open a potassium channel. Potassium will rush out of the cell, causing it to be even more positive on the outside, more negative on the inside, so we would end up with hyperpolarization, making it harder to activate the postsynaptic neuron, and this is what we call an IPSP. Again, this is a good point for you to now go back to your AMP flicks. I'm not going to play them right now, but I want you to go back and watch the generation of an action potential, the propagation of an action potential, and then we also have the events at the chemical synapse. So you can go back and watch in detail everything that we were just going through. The last thing to go over in this chapter is just this big long list of classes of neurotransmitters. I don't expect you to memorize them in a bunch of detail. I just wanted to kind of point some of them out to you that I thought you may find interesting. The one you do need to know in a lot of detail is one we've already spent a lot of time talking about, and that is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that is released at every neuromuscular junction. Every time a neuron is interacting with a muscle as an effector cell, that neuron is going to release acetylcholine because we always want to open a sodium channel and activate that muscle. We're also going to see this some more when we get into, I believe it's chapter 14, going into the autonomic nervous system. There are many other neurotransmitters I know you've heard of. You may just not realize that they are neurotransmitters. I'm sure many of you have heard of dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin. All of these are, belong to a category called the biogenic amines because they all have a um, nitrogen component if you look at their chemical structure. Some of these are involved with excitatory signals that make us excited. Uh, that would be things like epinephrine. Dopamine, serotonin are going to be more of the opposing ones. Serotonin is the one that makes you sleepy. Sometimes amino acids can act as neurotransmitters. We, sometimes you hear a lot on the news here lately about um, the um, GABA, it's, you know, we're not talking detail about it, but it's one that's becoming more and more popular for research. Your brain releases certain neuropeptides that act as neurotransmitters. These are just small little proteins. Uh, one major group I know you've heard of are endorphins. These are the natural opiates. This is the way your brain can make you not hurt when it wants to. If you've ever heard of someone talk about the, um, a runner's high, where after they've been running for so long, the pain goes away and it feels good. That's their brain releasing endorphins. Their muscles are still sore and it still hurts. Their brain's just not letting them know that it does anymore. Um, certain gases and fats can even act as neurotransmitters. 
nitric oxide is involved with learning and memory and some really cool research has been done in this area. Just, just very interesting stuff. What I expect you to be able to do with this is recognize these different names as, hey, I know that is a neurotransmitter. Beyond that, at this point, I just need you to make sure you know that acetylcholine is the important neurotransmitter released at all muscular junctions with the brain.